Okay, we're going to go ahead and uh, get started with our lesson for this evening. We're going to be picking back up in the um, the book of Second Kings. We're going to be looking at the 13th chapter. I'm going to give a a, a, a a review of where we were about a couple of weeks ago when when the last time it was that I spoke on this. So without further delay, what I want to do is go ahead and pray. Uh, I might do all of the 13th chapter of Second Kings. I might not. It'll depend on how it is as we proceed with the, uh, the lesson for this evening. Father, we thank you again for an opportunity to come together and look at your scripture. Um, we find that this is a way, the, 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 the instruction that you've left for us. Um, Want it to be a light into our past, uh, your word that we are to adhere to, to obey, to to be strengthened by, to be corrected by, and to be uh, uh, just given your spirit, full of your spirit. I'm asking that you will help us as we continue to study your word. That it be more than just learning how to talk about it, but that it will be the pattern for us to see changes that should be made. I'm asking that you give us your strength, help us from day to day um, when we're together, when we're not together, that we can be living epistles for the cause of your kingdom. I ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. So again, we're going to be looking in the uh, 13th chapter of Second Kings. I want to give a, a, a recap of where we have been because it's been, uh, I would say, two weeks now since we have looked at this. Um, when we were looking at um, the previous chapter, chapter 12, we were looking at the king of Judah primarily. And so to kind of, it's, it, it, it possibly will be confusing i'm almost i almost want to say no doubt it'll be confusing so that's not my goal tonight because uh as i've said so far in trying to teach um and expound upon uh the book of the kings and looking into the chronicles we find that there are some names that are so very similar as a matter of fact I was thinking so i want to kind of tell you what my title is even though i'm not necessarily going to pull out so much in that i just i just think what is there and so i'm going to go ahead and tell you my title something in a name um and i'll i will come back and talk about that a little bit something in a name well as i said there's there are names that are very similar and as we continue on in further chapters we're going to see even more of that what we have seen if i can kind of bring us back up to where we've been um, there was a king of the uh, of the south. That's the the southern uh, kingdom, if you will, because the kingdom was split. This king, as a child, uh, he was hidden. His name was uh, Joash. He was hidden because Athaliah had uh, assumed the uh, the throne, if you will. So, uh, they would call her queen, if you will, uh, ruling over Judah, and she had the people worshiping Baal. Well, anyway, this Joash who had been hidden away as an infant, we understand that he became the king in a, at an early age. I want to say seven. Sometimes I think eight, but I want to say seven. And this child, he was instructed in the ways of God by Jehoiada. Jehoiada, Jehoiada rather, was a righteous high priest. And in the process of time, they brought Jehoiada, and, and I'm talking about Jeho, Joash. I want to really keep his name straight if I can, because we're going to be, as we come to where we are on this evening, we're going to, he's going to be an adult, but I want us to remember who he was. It's the one that was hidden away. When they brought him out, Athaliah was very upset and she called treason. Now, this Athaliah, she was Ahab and Jezebel's daughter. Well, um, jo Joash reigned righteously during the time that Jehoiada the high priest was living. During the time that Jehoiada the high, the high priest was living, Joash determines, and you can go back and read, he says, I want to repair the temple, the, the I'm going to call it the holy place of God. 
it was necessary to do that because under Athaliah's reign and many who I guess had lived before, the temple had gone in disrepair. There were some parts that were worn and so forth. And the reason why, if you look in Second Chronicles, it said that those princes and the people that were under Athaliah, the monies that were received that were supposed to impart the use to restore and keep the temple uh, let's say beautiful and 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 uh just keep it up that money was used to help i'm going to say it said in this way to support the worship of baal so anyway the monies that were received uh Joash, he would determine, he said, well, this certain amount of time has passed and the, the temple has not been restored. He calls Joida, the priest, and they ask about it. So they determine we're going to take money a different way. He has a box. Uh, some people might call it a store or a chest to be built, drilled the hole in it, and they was put money in there. Once they acquired enough money, determines, OK, now we're going to repair the temple that was done. But if we, we found out in the scripture that there was a time when Jehoiada, the high priest, when he when he died and he passed off the scene at. OK, I'm saying at around this time and or after Jehoiada's death, we see something that happens with Joash. Joash, the one who had been hidden away, Joash, the one who was ruling righteously, Joash, the one who had been under the instruction of God. He was influenced by uh, some, I want to say the princes, <clears throat> some young people who came and they, and they enticed him to follow after the ways uh, that were contradictory to God's word. I think if you would like to kind of see that, you could turn to Second Chronicles, the 24th chapter, and you could look at or starting at maybe the 17th verse. As a matter of fact, I do want to go there because when we go into the 13th chapter, it's going to switch a little bit from where we're talking about the king of the South Judah. We want to talk a little bit about <laughs> the king of the north. So I want to turn to Second uh, Chronicles, the 24th chapter. And I want to start at that uh, 17th verse and read down to the 20th verse because it's it's a it's a sad affair. But all throughout the scripture, we see um, people rejecting the word of God. And we study the word of God because we see the things that anger God. I did say anger God. And we see God's instruction. We see God's correction. And sometimes we'll see his mercy. But at the same time, we'll see when God says enough is enough. If you're at Second Chronicles, the 24th chapter and the 17th first i want you to read now we're we're still looking at uh, in this i guess synopsis if you will at joash of the uh the south would you read Dre? now after the death of jehoiada came the princes of judah and made obeisance to the king then the king hearkened unto them and they left the house of yahweh god of their fathers and served groves and ice and wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for this their trespass. Yet he sent prophets to them to bring them again unto Yahweh. And they testified against them, but they would not give ear. Okay, I want you to hold up just for a second. Jehoiada, the righteous high priest, had instructed this young king, this young king, as he was growing older, should have been more seasoned, should have been mature, complete in the things of God, but he was influenced. We got to understand that there are different things that will compete for one's allegiance to continue to be faithful to God. These princes come to him and they swake him to turn the true worship of the only true living God to going back to the very things that God told them. Do not take the ways of these other nations. And they began to go and they serve groves and then so forth like that. And Dre, pick back up where you are. Wait a minute. They sent prophets. Now, when you look at this verse, it's, it looks plural, at least in, in the English. These prophets aren't named, but they sent prophet God saying that God sent prophets to warn this king. In God's mercy, 
he'll send rebuke. In God's mercy, he'll send warning. So not only the scriptures tell us were prophets sent, now we're going to get a specific, specific individual. What's his name? Do you read this next verse? 20th, 20th verse. And the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest, which stood above the people and said unto them, Thus saith God, Why transgress ye the commandments of Yahweh, that you cannot prosper? Because you have forsaken Yahweh. He has also forsaken you. Now, Jehoiada, the one who had instructed this uh, this king, Joash, uh, He's, he's passed off the scene and his son, Zechariah, he comes and it's almost as if, okay, well, you respected my father. My father respected God. He gave you God. He gave you God, God's counsel. Now, it's not saying in the scripture that, well, because Zechariah was his son, he expected to obey him. But it seems it just seems like it would be there. The overarching thing is that he was still giving God's word. And the fact is, is that Joash did not like the correction. And he kills Zechariah. He kills the very son of the man who had helped him. And he had, well, he has him stoned. And we're going to see later on in that um, Joash, just, just read down a little bit, Dree, under this 21st verse. And they conspired, and they conspired against him mm -hmm. and stoned him with stones at the commandment of the king in the court of the house of Yahweh. Read. Thus Joash the king remembered not the kindness which Jehoiada his father had done to him, but slew his son. And when he died, he said, Yahweh look upon it and require it. Okay, so in, in, in looking at this Joash, the prophet, even though he was dying, it's like he's able to speak and say, God's going to require this wickedness. At your hand is like you're you you're going to die as well. Well, and and still looking a little bit at this uh, synopsis, we understand that there was um, a problem with the the nation of Syria. Syria, the Syrian king Hazael. We looked at Hazael before, and Hazael had been. If you were wanted to go back and look at Second Kings the eighth chapter, and uh, this Hazael, he 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 becomes powerful, just like it was prophesied. And Hazael, he determines that he's going to go and he's going to raid and conquer portions of the, the land of uh, of the Philistines. And while he's going, then that's that would be uh, uh, southwestward toward the, uh, the Mediterranean Sea, if you will. And he determines I'm going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to raid them as well. And what happens is Joash, king of the uh, of the south, southern kingdom, he beget, he gets afraid. You can see this uh, also in in Second Kings. I want to say again the the I believe it's the the it might be the eleventh chapter. Uh, the end of eleventh chapter, he determines that he's going to take take gold and silver and things out of the house of God to appease Hazael the king. Well. <laughs> We see a man that is turned uh, uh, away from God. He is now suffering because of that. So we're getting ready now to enter into this next chapter, the 13th chapter of Second Kings. But I want to at least talk a little bit about my title and why I came up with the title. It's because I know, first of all, we're going into some names. There's several names that are very, um, I can I say similar. So I'm going to go back just a little bit. You might not even remember exactly the order because it, it is confusing. We've seen two kings that have been named Jehoram. There's been a Jehoram of the north. There's been a Jehoram of the south. We've seen two kings that have been named Ahaziah. There's been an Ahaziah of the north. There's been an Ahaziah of the south. We're seeing kings now. I'm going to mention the the, the, the names of the kings that we'll be looking at, Lord willing, on tonight and, and on into uh, subsequent uh, lessons and our teachings. Joash, Jehoash, and jo Jehoash. In many cases, you could pronounce them all that way. But as we continue to go into the lessons, I'm going to try to say one maybe over the other. And so I was, as I was looking at this, it was it, it's really sad to me, but something in the name. 
something in the name and uh what I've seen in the scripture is that often God will let an individual or have an individual be named and it would talk about one who is like God and so forth. Or we'll see in the scriptures where God might change a name, for instance, Jacob to Israel or uh, Sarai to uh, Sarah. So before we get ready to go a little bit into the 13th chapter, when I say something in the name, I was just I, I was just thinking, I said, could it be? Because I don't think there's anything coincidental in the scripture that God wanted us to see how when Jehoshaphat allowed his son to marry uh, Ahab's daughter from the north, that these kingdoms, even though they were split, they had become so tainted and so willing to disobey God that they were just it was they were the same the same kind of wicked the same kind of rebellious the same kind of religious serving god supposedly serving baal that there would be those who would be of the remnant but we see in the preponderance of scripture it would look like that they would try to hold on to that which was a semblance of what righteousness was but would totally reject god so when I say something in the name and I start to talk about these names and it gets confusing, it looks like their identity is the same. The name is the same. It, I don't know if you if you like the thought, but it, I think it's there. So I do want to say before we go back into this text and look at the 13th chapter, we can understand that Judah did have righteous kings from time to time. The northern kingdom, Israel did not. But to let oneself be influenced by the wicked ways of this world, or that's in that sense, the kingdom of Satan, Baal, it, it, there's a picture for us. What's our name? Something in the name. So let's go a little bit into this 13th chapter on this evening. So we, we leave off with understanding that Joash has pleased I mean, I'm sorry, he began by pleasing the Lord and then he turned away from the Lord. And before I go into the 13th verse, I do just want to go back to the 20th verse of the 24th chapter. And I'm going to read just a little bit of what Zechariah posed to him as a question. Why transgress ye the commandments of the Lord that ye cannot prosper? It's like you chose to walk away. You won't prosper. You might have maybe uh stalled uh the, the 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 Syrian army coming against you but God knows and this this is the part that really stands out to me because ye have forsaken the Lord he has also forsaken you he said God he, he said God's forsaken you your position as king of uh of of Judah it, it's 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 inconsequential. It's it doesn't matter. You forsook God, and so He forsook you. You still look like the king. You still have an army up under you, but you forsook God. If there's nothing else, that thing should that that verse that thing should ring out in our in our minds right now. Don't walk away from the Lord and be consistent in that. There's a repenting that must 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 take place. If an individual walks away from the Lord, understand, he'll let you do that. Let's go into this uh, 13th chapter. I got to make sure I'm back in the right one because I'll be in, in, in Chronicles. Second uh, Kings 13th chapter. I'd like you to read down, Dre, until about the uh, the ninth verse. And we'll talk a little bit about this here. In the three and twentieth year of Joash the son of Ahaziah, king of Judah. Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu, began to reign over Israel and Samaria and reigned 17 years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of Yahweh and followed the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which made Israel to sin. He departed not therefrom. And the anger of Yahweh was kindled against Israel. And he delivered them into the hand of Hazael, king of Syria, and into the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Hazael, all their days. And Jehoahaz besought Yahweh, and Yahweh hearkened unto him, 
for he saw the oppression of Israel, because the king of Syria oppressed them. And Yahweh give, gave Israel a savior, so that they went out from under the hand of the Syrians. And the children of Israel dwelt in their tents as before time. Nevertheless, they departed not from the sins of the house of Jeroboam, who made Israel sin, but walked therein, and there remained the grove also in Samaria. Neither did he leave of the people to Jehoahaz, but fifty horsemen and ten chariots, and ten thousand footmen, for the king of Syria had destroyed them and had made them like the dust by threshing. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoahaz, and all that he did, and his might, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? Read verse 9, please. And Jehoahaz slept with his fathers, and they buried him in Samaria. And Joash, his son, mm -hmm. reigned in his stead. <laughs> okay, thank you. Bef before I go and we look at, at, at these verses here, um, I spent um, a good portion of the beginning of this lesson sort of in a, in a recap. I, I'm sorry. I, I just did it wrong. In a recap. Okay, so because th these names there, I think you can agree with me. So I was talking about uh, Joash, who was king of the south, who started out as a little boy. My wife just read the ninth, the, the ninth verse, and we're seeing something about a Jehoahash as well as a Joash. And I say something in a name. So this, this is part of where I get this from. But I want to go back because we're seeing some similar, similar, similar behavior. I just want to come up with these human beings, with these human beings. Oh, my gosh. People don't change throughout history. It's natural for people to be selfish, wicked, stubborn. Uh, 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 uh. You can, you can just deceitful. We could go on and on. People don't change for righteousness, except for or by the word of God. Except for or by the Spirit of God, to change according to his word, then to live a life of righteousness in an ordered fashion of his judgment. Let's go look at what's going on. So we're moving from talking about, I'm trying to get these names right, from talking about the king of Judah, now we're going to talk about the king of Israel. Listen, so it mentions them. So <laughs> let's go back to this 13th chapter here in the first verse. Listen, in the three and 20th year of Joash, uh, the son of Ahaziah, king of Judah, that's the one we just got through talking about who was, who was hidden away, Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu, began to reign over Israel and Samaria and reigned 17 years. Now, some commentaries will talk a lot about that, uh, about the years and sometimes overlapping and problems, it seems, that's in there. Um, I think that's I think that's good, but it's it's really not where I want to place a focus. So the king of Israel is mentioned because what we'll see is there is an overlapping where one king will be reigning and then will pass away, while another king in the counterpart, the south or the or the uh, or, or the north, in this case, uh, the north will become king. That's basically what is given us to know. Now, but it's mentioned in Jehoahaz as being the son of Jehu. Who was Jehu? Jehu was prophesied. Jehu was the one who uh, had gone to the, the temple of Baal, had to uh, close it up. And he had those, I think it was 80 men. He had, he had, he had well, 80 men to serve as, how can I say, guards. And he had those men. He tricked them, made him made them think, you know what, I'm, I'm going to worship Baal. And he had them killed. Okay. Jehu started out. Mm, and, God was pleased with how Jehu started out, but the Bible says that Jehu did not leave off of the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Oh, my Lord. Let's, so let's, let's go back into this. Listen, 
In the third, in the three and twentieth year of Joash, the son of Ahaziah, king of Judah, Jehoahaz, son of Jehu, began to reign over Israel in Samaria and reigned seventeen years. The second verse reads like this. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord and followed the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which made Israel to sin. And he departed not therefrom. Jehu's legacy was one of, um, it looked like he really was self-serving. Remember, we talked about it and that when he was, it was told that he was going to be the king, uh, he, 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 he did clear out the, the, the worship and so forth to Baal, but still it's like, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm liking a little bit of this power. So when he, uh, dies or goes off the scene this is what his son continues to do so it's 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 really sad when we look at the behavior there is something in the heart of man that if is not kept in check the heart of a woman the heart of a child that we will walk outside of the ways of god this is what the scripture tells us it is not looking in oneself. He said, Gary, you're going outside of the text. Well, I know that the Bible says that things that were written about history in the scriptures, it is really written there so that as we rehearse it and we talk about it and we study it and we meditate on it, I'm not talking about it. I'm, I'm like, Lord, what do you want me to see? That we can see that the pattern of man is to fulfill his own desire. And Jesus said, and I'm going, I'm going to talk about what the master said. Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you must take up your cross. And you've got to deny self. If, if you're going to follow me, you've got to deny yourself of your own will. Have mercy. All the ways of a man seem right in his own eyes. I know what uh, the Bible tells us about those who feel like they're wise, those who feel like they're noble, those sometimes even the aged people, unless the rich, unless the one who knows something about life and experience, if he or she is not governed by the word of God, I'm going to tell you right now, I hope you already know, the person is bound for hell. Matters not the position. It matters not the age. It matters not the strength. It matters not the experience. That individual is bound for hell. This is why we read the scriptures. So here is now Jehoahaz, son of Jehu. He continues in walking outside of the will of God. Now, Jeroboam the first, because there will be a Jeroboam the second, Lord willing, we get to him. Jeroboam the first is mentioned so many times in the scripture. I think is I wrote it down. Um, I think we read about Jeroboam the first, and um, it, maybe I wrote maybe because it's sometimes it's in various places. But I wrote down First Kings twelve twenty six. If you want to see it, First Kings twelve. If you look at twenty six and go through about the thirty first verse. So just a little bit on Jeroboam, and when I go back to where we are tonight. Um, when we were in the earlier portion of looking at the beginning of the kings, we learned about Saul, we learned about David, and we learned about Solomon. Solomon have a son, and his name would be Rehoboam. And then with Rehoboam, we see that there was a split, and there we have the name Jeroboam. When Rehoboam wanted the people in the southern kingdom to continue after him, that's where the temple was. Well, we saw that God sent a prophet to, uh, uh, I forgot the prophet's name. I want to say Abijah, Abijah, I forget. I think it's Abijah. He goes to uh, uh, Rehoboam and he tell him, tells him, you, you, you're going to be king. Did, did I say Rehoboam? He goes to Jeroboam and he tells him he's going to be king. I'm not, try, I'm not trying to confuse us tonight, but this, this is part of the history. Jeroboam, because he's like, well, I don't want the people to stop giving their allegiance to me is really more about me and it's not about God. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change some dates. And instead of having the people go down to the South, if they go to the temple, they might forget about me. So how about I make two more worship centers? So we have one just above Jerusalem 
and they'll have one at the at the very north, if you will, of Palestine. So that way the people won't have to go there. And he changed the worship in the sense that he, 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 he inaugurated something different. He was still religious. He was still the king that God had set set there before him. There's going to be another Jeroboam. But even we have these kings right here. It is as if they're Jeroboam following after their father, Jeroboam. God did not say set up Dan. God did not say set up Bethel. Who caused the people to sin? And after all these years, the people are still following after wickedness, after wickedness, after wickedness. When can we break the pattern? So when we see. This verse here, there's a lot of history there. Uh, I thought about trying to go in and look on how many years it passed, and I didn't. But some significant years have passed. So I want to go back, and I'm going to start back at this. I want you to read the, the first or the third verse. And if it's too repetitious, then you just have to part. You don't have to, but I'll ask it. But I want you to read that first through the third verse, please. In the three and twentieth year mm -hmm. of Joash, the son of Ahaziah, king of Judah, Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu, began to reign over Israel and Samaria, mm -hmm. and reigned seventeen years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of Yahweh, and followed the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which made Israel to sin. Mm -hmm. He departed not therefrom. And the anger of Yahweh was kindled against Israel, and he delivered them into the hand of Hazael, king of Syria, and into the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Hazael, all their day. You understand what's going on? We saw Hazael. I just talked about how Joash of, of the, of the uh, make sure I get this right, of Judah, he was afraid. Hazah had, Hazah had gone to conquer parts of, uh, of the, some Philistine cities, and he went over to Jerusalem. Joash was afraid. He said, here's some gold. Here's some gold from the temple. God said, God said you have forsaken me. I'm going to forsake you. Look at Hazael. When Elijah told Hazael, he said, you are going to, you're going to injure. You're going to hurt. You're not going to care about the people of God. God used Hazael. God used Hazael as a vessel to judge his people because they had walked outside of his will. Now, not only has Hazael dealt with Judah, Hazael is now dealing with the people from the north. And then we even read of his son. A lot of the times, the, uh, the kings, if you will, of Syria, they would be called Ben Hadad or Adad. I don't, I don't remember. I think sometimes you'll see it spelled with an H. Sometimes you'll see it spelled with an A. And God is allowing all of this. Why are we seeing this? Because we see Je Je Jehoahaz. He decides, I'm going to keep doing what Jeroboam did. Let me say something. If And I've said it already. The scripture is written so that we see if you continue to persist in sin, God, I think it's in Hebrews. I want to say it's around 10 and 26. I think it's around 10 and 26. Uh, I confuse it sometimes with first Peter two. You, you continue in sin. You continue in sin. The Bible says, Adri, if you got it and it looks like it, there remains no more sacrifice for sin. If, if that's it, I, I want us to read it, even though it's in the New Testament. Or if we sin willfully. After that, we have received knowledge of the truth. There remains no more sacrifice for sin. If you sin willfully, just keep on and keep on. And that's your practice. That's your will. That's your way. I'll call on God when I want him, but I'm still going to do what I want to. If you continue to do that, how can, how can there be a sacrifice for you? There is no real change. There is no real change. Call on God, but keep doing the same thing. Listen, this is what the scripture says. Be not deceived. Don't fool yourself. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. He knows when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows when you've been bad or good. So don't be trying to pull something over his eyes. I know that ain't what it says. But the scripture says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Well, he that sowed to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. That's damnation. That's death. That's God's righteous judgment. 
Yeah. So, listen, the anger of the Lord, uh, it was kindled against what this Joahash was doing. And so he allowed Hazael and his offspring to, con to come against uh, Israel as well as they had come against Judah. Listen at the fourth verse. And Jehoah has besought the Lord, and the Lord hearkens unto him, for he saw the oppression of Israel because the king of Syria oppressed them. It looks like um well let's 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 look at what the scripture says. Um this I, I I'm gonna call it a beat down. This judgment you know, when God, we look at how the scriptures talk about it. Um, and, 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 and one sense, we'll see that I think Ezekiel says it, it doesn't please him to like uh, kill an individual, but it does please him because in, in the sense of I'm going to rid the world of righteousness, of I mean, unrighteousness, if someone's going to do that. But it's like, I'd rather that you return. I'd rather that you repent. Even Jesus said, I, how does it, Jesus say it? Uh, I would rather a sacrifice, uh, repentance rather, mercy. When they were talking about bringing the sacrifice and stuff, he says, I would rather have mercy on you because you bring forth fruit of repentance. We see it looks like this. Uh, Jehoahaz is repenting because of the judgment. It's to turn us all around. It's to turn us all around and bring them back into the right ways of life it's to return the individual or a nation uh, a family however it's god deals with man or woman on all levels all levels a world that's what he that's what he really wanted from the beginning those who would serve him to turn an interval back into the wisdom of God so that a people might live. But Jehovah has besought the Lord and the Lord heard. It's like he heard Israel's cry, um, the Hebrews cry when they were in bondage because of what this king, uh, uh, the Syrian nation were doing. The fifth verse, and the Lord gave Israel a savior. Isn't that beautiful? Oh, just, just, just the way it reads. And the Lord gave Israel a deliverer, a savior, so that they went out from under the hand, the power of the Syrians who was oppressing them, oppressing them, and the children of Israel dwelt in their tents as before time. It's like God gave them relief. Now, this king, this was the time for this king to remain in God's stead. This was the time king to continue to grow this was a time for this king to remember anything that he knew about the forefathers kings before what the word of god said they had god's word oh lord god delivered them the savior is this not a is this not a picture of what god did with the son is this not a picture of what we saw in this in the judges is this not a picture of what we saw god do with moses <sighs> lord have mercy nevertheless here it is is there a nevertheless in our lives it's a, it's a it's um question to think about if there is a nevertheless even though i haven't reread portion of the scripture and all we need to we need to seek the lord um and ask him for strength and direction and it, often he's given direction we just need to go back to it isn't that right we do listen and the lord gave israel a savior so that savior so they went off from under the hand of the syrians and the children of israel dwelt in their tent tense as before time nevertheless there's a problem here they departed not from the sins of the house of jeroboam who made israel to sin but walked therein and they remain in the groves also in samaria what's these groves the trees now the trees god had told them he said i don't want you to worship anything in the heavens i don't really i don't want you worshiping the, the things in nature read read all of romans the first chapter you see how they would try to change the image of the living god and so forth this is something that god said don't do it don't do it but see god gives he, he, he can 
this is this is this the people who say God is such a mean God, you need to watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. We talked about how the potter can can break that that uh, uh, vessel that he is making to do what he wants to with it. People won't people won't come to the scripture right here. Give it a chance for them to grow and stay in his righteousness. That they turned and went the way of wickedness. It's still religious. It's still cultural, but it's not righteous under God. It's not. God's not changing either. He's not changing saints. Listen at this. Nevertheless, they departed not from the sins of the house of Jeroboam, who made Israel to sin, but walked therein and remained, uh, uh, remained the groves of Syria. Neither did he leave the peak. I'm sorry. Neither and remained the grove also in Samaria. Mm -hmm. Neither did he leave of the people to Jehoahaz, but fifty horsemen and ten chariots and ten thousand footmen. For the king of Syria had destroyed them and had made them like the dust by threat. It goes back and it's picking up with uh I don't know if it's the specific battle here, because remember we just read that it was talking about Hazel and his son. They had it. So there there was conflict. We we've seen it in previous chapters, first Kings and Second Kings, where there would be a time where they weren't having problems and they'd go back to them. It's always conflict. It's always conflict. One nation wants to be over another nation, just like one person wants to oppress another person because people are selfish. That's what I was talking about in the beginning. Think of nations as people. Think of countries as people. Just selfish. That's why we all need to be under God's government. Lord have mercy. So they just continued on with that wickedness and read, read the next first read. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoahaz and all that he did and his might, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? Now it looks like when we read this here, that Jehoahaz repented and it, it looks sincere. I don't know how much time passed. What we see is that God heard, and but it, it almost looks like the weight of it is because of the way the Syrians were oppressing the people of God. But um, I'm not going to say that he wasn't sincere, but we see with the passing of time, his heart didn't remain steadfast or remember what God said. God always said, I don't, I don't want you to forget me. If I bless you, don't forget me. We just saw when we were looking in on uh, Second Chronicles uh, 24 chapter. How Joash of the uh, south was told, you forsook God, so he's going to forsake you. So if, if, if God pardons, if, if, if God restores, let's don't, let's don't look at God the wrong way. First of all, he doesn't, he doesn't have to. He doesn't have to. Now, something in the name. Has God changed our names? Are we the children of this wicked one, the prince and the power of the air, are we the children of God, the true children of God who will be corrected by him, who will be instructed by him, who will be, let's say, protected by him, who will be loved by him. We can't force God and we can't trick him. We can't force him and we can't trick him. Let's read on down a little bit more, Dre, going on into some more of this uh, 13th chapter here. And Jehoahaz slept with his fathers, and they buried him in Samaria. And Joash, his son, reigned in his stead. In the thirty and seventh year of Joash, king of Judah, began Jeho Jehoash, the son of Jehoahaz, to reign over Israel in Samaria, and reigned sixteen years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of Yahweh. He departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel sin, but he walked therein. And the rest of the acts of Joash and all that he did, and his might wherewith he fought against Amaziah, king of Judah, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? And Joash slept with his fathers, and Jeroboam sat upon his throne. And Joash was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel. Let's look at these verses. Uh, I believe they're a little confusing, but we're going to look at them. And then um, we're going to continue on a little bit more in this uh, particular chapter. Ninth verse says, And Jehoah Jehoahaz, 
slept with his father, then they buried him in Samaria. That's what he's talking about, the king of uh, of the north. And Joash's son <laughs> reigned in his stead. All right. King of Israel, Jehoahaz, who we just talked about, who repented, has a son. His name is Joash, just like who I started out talking about in the beginning. That's why I said something in the name. They look very similar in that they're displeasing God. It's the behavior, it seems, of men, does it not? Yes. So we're going to now look at this 10th verse. In the 37th year of Joash, king of Judah, began Je Jehoash, the son of Jehoash, to reign over Israel. Now, remember I talked about the overlapping of kings and sometimes one would die uh, while another one would come on the scene, whether it was the south or the north. So we see this here. So it won't mention per se right here the when and the where, but we've been looking at the scriptures. So we, we know that there's a new king coming on, if you will, in the... <laughs> Get this right in the uh in, in Israel. So listen again. Uh in the 37th year of Joash, king of Judah, began Jeho Jeho Jehoash, the son of Jehoash, to reign over Israel and Samaria and reign 16 years. So it goes on to tell us something about the longevity. Let's read on down. And he did that which <laughs> was evil in the sight of the Lord. So we, so we have another evil king. Now, okay, so we had Jehu, you had Joash. And and okay, this was the north, and now we have Jeho Jehoahaz to reign in Israel and Samaria, who's reigning sixteen years. Evil, well, Jehu did, Jehu did a little bit that was right. And we have evil and evil, something something in the name, but even beyond the name, something in in being human, uh, except for the 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 will and the judgment and the commandments of God. Listen at 11th verse. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, and he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, but walked there. And these kings in the north, it's just like very diseased. And I do mean disease. Some of them did have physical diseases, but diseased with rebelliousness, re diseased in, 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 in spiritual wickedness. And then it goes on, it kind of gives a synopsis. And the rest of the acts of Joash and all that he did and his might, wherewith he fought against Amaziah, king of Judah, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? Now, I contemplated on talking about Amaziah uh, on this evening. I think it's Second Chronicles 25. But I've chosen to go ahead and hopefully complete this particular chapter. So, Lord willing, on next week, we'll talk about Amaziah. <laughs> so there'll be, uh, hopefully my recaps aren't too long, but I really hope it, more than anything that they help bring us back to kind of where we are again with names that are very confusing. So listen to the 13th verse. And Joash slept with his fathers and Jeroboam, okay, and Jeroboam set upon <laughs> Upon his throne, and Joash was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel. So we get to Elisha, which uh, it's been a while since we've we've talked about Elisha. Dre, I want you to read this 15th verse on down to the 25th verse. Let me see what time it is. Okay. Right. Okay, 14th verse. Yes. Now Elisha was fallen sick of the sickness whereof he died. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down to him and wept over his face and said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And Elisha said unto him, Take bow and arrows. And he took unto him bow and arrows. And he said to the king of Israel, Put thine hand upon the bow. And he put his hand upon it. And Elisha put his hands upon the king's hands. And he said, Open the window eastward. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, Shoot. And he shot. And he said, The arrow of Yahweh's deliverance, and the arrow of deliverance from Syria. For thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphek, till thou hast consumed them. And he said, Take the arrows. And he took them. And he said unto the king of Israel, Smite upon the ground. And he smote thrice and stayed. And the man of God was wroth with him and said, Thou shouldest have smitten five or six times. Then hadst thou smitten Syria till thou hadst consumed. Whereas now thou shalt smite Syria but thrice. Okay. And Elijah died. This is the 20th. Okay. 
and Elisha died, and they buried him. And the bands of the Moabites invaded the land at the coming in of the year. And it came to pass, as they were burying a man, that behold, they spied a band of men, and they cast the man into the sepulchre of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood up on his feet. But Hazael, king of Syria, oppressed Israel all the days of Jehoahaz. And Yahweh was gracious unto them, and had compassion on them, and had respect unto them, because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and would not destroy them, neither cast he them from his presence as yet. So Hazael, king of Syria, died, and Ben-Hadad, his son, reigned in his stead. And Jehoahaz and Jehoash, the son of Jehoahaz, took again out of the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Hazael, the cities, which he had taken out of the hand of Jehoahaz, his father, by war. Three times did Joash beat him and recovered the cities of Israel. Wait, this, is, this is sort of like another um, scene or uh, historical scenario or scenarios if you want to look at it that way, what's going on? Um, is I don't know how old Elisha was at this time, but we see that Elisha was very uh, great man, powerful man, because he uh, remained in the ways of God. Elisha had studied and been, um, I think, trained is such a poor word, but learned and received wisdom under Elijah. So we see that Elisha has fallen sick. And so this looks like natural causes. And it's very interesting because we see with all of the strength and the, the, the obedience that he had toward God, God still call him. So there's a lot of people who believe that if you're a child of God, you're, you're not supposed to have any sickness. Let's understand that the scripture says it's appointed unto man wants to die. Now, there's some scholars who believe that the Savior that we saw that delivered um, Israel before, I'm referring to the fifth verse, and the Lord gave Israel a Savior so that they went off from under the hands of Syrians. Some scholars actually believe that this was Elisha. I can't say that. When I was looking in Josephus, uh, it, it he he said and Josephus, I'm not saying that he his word is gospel, but when we look at the accounts that's often in Josephus, you'll see that they they line up with the scripture. And so sometimes because of historical accounts, he was a historian, we can get a little more information. Josephus, if I, if if I'm remembering correctly, he kind of makes it seem that um when this when Elisha dies, that uh make sure I get the the is it Jehoahash who goes to visit him. Uh, if, if if you see it, I want you to help me. Joash, yeah, cause the, the names get confusing for me too. When he goes to see him, it's like he was um scared because uh Elisha had fought so many battles um for for the nation of Israel. Now go back to uh, Josephus and why I mentioned him. Uh, it is believed, at least the way I think that Joe uh, Josephus wrote it, is because that this king knew that um. Elisha had won many battles without having to fight, but because of his righteousness and his relationship and his obedience to God, and that he was going to miss uh, Elisha's presence. Now, again, I can't tell you if that's it exactly, but I think it's something to think about. Imagine we've seen that the kings often were selfish and so forth. So I just wanted to kind of share that uh, that a little bit. So let's go back to where we are. Um. We're at the 14th verse. Now, Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness whereof he died. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him and wept over his face and said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Now, this sounds uh, very much like what Elijah, I think it was Elisha that said this to Elijah when I think it's in the, I want to say it's the second chapter of Second Kings when Elijah's taking up through the whirlwind. And why, why is that? Because Elijah also was a very uh, forceful man, an obedient man, prophet, who could, um, how can I say, who, who, who would deliver the people and, 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 and just being obedient to God. And they could see God's presence, God's will done through a prophet. Why am I saying this? Because remember when that, um, that servant was afraid, and he said, like, God opened his eyes in the chariots and the horses of fire. It's like, OK, so it was like it was equated 
uh, or Elijah was equated with that. So Elijah following in the same vein, being subservient, obedient to God. Looks like he's he's got the same. I don't know if you call it an epitaph the same name uh, uh, description given unto him. Well, let's continue on. So Elisha talking unto, let me make sure I get the name right, uh, Joash, king of Israel. He says, I want you to do something. Elijah said unto him, take bow and arrows. And he took them unto the bow. Uh, let's see. And he took unto him bow and arrows. I'm at the 16th verse. And he said unto the king of Israel, put thine hand upon the bow. And he put his hand upon it. And Elijah put his hand upon the king's hand. And he said, unto him, open the windows eastward. And he opened it. And Elijah said, shoot. And he shot. And he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria. For thou shalt smite the series of Apex till the they have consumed him. Now, one of the things that I had looked at, I don't even think it was this week. It was last week. That it was customary often when, let's say for some ancient uh, customs, when there was going to be a war, to declare to the other uh, uh, nation, the counter, counter nation, that they would shoot three arrows in their direction to let them know that war was about to ensue. So a lot of times when we're studying the Bible, we can actually learn some historical things. A lot of times you'll find that there would be conditions of peace. We're going to come and you can decide whether you don't want to uh, listen to us. We'll just come and overthrow you or you can be our vassals. So this is one thing. It's, it, I think it was the last week it was the first time that I had read something like that. Perhaps that is the case right here, because when you look at ancient cultures, you often see some similarities, even though we're looking at the the, the nations that are supposed to be uh, uh, the nation or people of God. So what happens after Elijah puts his hand on him? This almost seems like, I don't want to say stamp of approval, but God is with you. <laughs> if you will, do, if you will do what God says. He's with you. Well, he puts his hand, he puts his hand on his hand and they shoot the arrows. Now listen at what he says. There's further instruction here. And he said, take the arrows. And he took them. And he said to the king of Israel, smite upon the ground. I, I didn't look up what the word smite means. It could be strike really hard. Let's say smite upon the ground. And this is what, let me make sure I'm saying it. Joash, did I get it right? Uh, Joash did he smote three times and stayed now years ago i can hear um some um some i guess interference um if you can mute that for me it'll be it'll be wonderful years ago um i read this it didn't it didn't really m mean something to me and that i understood it i remember when um pastor tim taught this and I remember I was like, I, I still didn't understand. Why did he get mad? And he probably explained it. Um, I might have been tired. I don't know, but I, I didn't get it. Looking at it now, I'm like, okay. When you are working on behalf of God, you want to do it as in God's strength as thoroughly as possible. He smites, Joash smites the ground three times. And <laughs> the man of God gets upset. It's like, didn't I? It's like, it seems to be like, didn't I do what I was supposed to do? It's like, okay, your heart, God gives instructions so that you can grow and begin to think his ways and his thoughts after him. You want to utterly destroy it. It makes me think of when I keep seeing, and they, they let's say, the, the worship of Baal was discontinued by Jehu, but then they continue in the ways of. Uh, uh, Jeroboam, son of Nebat. No, God's like, you got to get this wickedness out. You got to destroy wickedness. Don't leave room for it. Because remember, I'm talking a little bit. We'll go back to the scriptures. There's only a few more left. When they came out of Egypt, their hearts were still in Egypt, even though God was delivering them. Moses, you brought us out here to die. Then they started lying. We had this kind of food and we had that kind of. Wow. Wow. How soon a people will forget who God is, what his demands are, and the promise that they made. All oh, that thou hast said. Well, they hadn't got to that part yet, but still. Same people. Well, listen to how it reads. He says, smite the ground. 19th verse. 
And the man of God was wroth with him and said, Thou should have had smitten five or six times. Then thou hast smitten Syria till thou hast consumed it. Whereas now thou shalt smite Syria but thrice. Um, the way he talks to him, it's as if you should have known. Joash, you should have known. Do you really want to do this? Are you really fighting? Now, when we look at how these kings would just turn away, like your heart, it's like you haven't given your whole heart. And that's a problem. Something in the name of man who will still want to reserve and keep some things for themselves. Listen, and a man of God was wroth with him and said, Thou should have smitten five or six times. Then thou had smitten Syria till thou hast consumed it, whereas now thou shalt smite Syria but thrice. Like now this text ends in this 13th chapter, and Elisha died. And they buried him, and the hands of the Moabites invaded the land at the coming, uh, at the coming of the year. So we're seeing, okay, let's think about it. We've talked about how Moabites have been a problem. We've talked about how the Edomites have been a problem, the days of Jehoshaphat. We've talked about how the Syrians have been a problem. We've seen both the kings of the north and kings of the south waffle or totally just be rebellious. And God said, okay, what, what, all of this is leading up to the captivity that would really take place later on. It's leading up to God gives time for repentance. God gives time for correction. God gives time for growth in his standards, in his righteousness, commandments, precepts, laws. We've been going through Psalms 19. I said 19. We went through that. And this, I think if you start around the seventh, eighth verse, it's good. But Psalms 119. Well, Elisha dies and they bury him. And this, uh, the other uh, enemy nation come up against him. Listen at the 21st verse. And it came to pass as they were burying a man. I would read this to be the Israelites. Behold, they spied a band of men and they cast that man into a sepulcher of Elisha. And when the man was let down, uh, the, was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood up on his feet. This <laughs> to me. It's just, it's first of all, it's 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 miraculous, it's supernatural, it's God, I believe, showing like um, you had a man of God. It's a picture of the resurrection of uh, the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. They put they're burying this uh, individual and they put him down on the bones of Elisha and I, I I can't give explanation for it, but God allowed this to happen. The spirit of God had been so strong that God, God, they could have done it in the Bible phase. They just let it put that. But the Bible is showing us that this man was revived. What about the words that came from this man? Probably have some people excavating, trying to find those bones so they could go sell them on TV and tell you that you need to give a whole bunch more than a tithe. I, people, people probably have done that. Let me go back to the text. This man was revived and he stood on his feet. It makes me think of the Valley of Dry Bones too in Ezekiel. Lord have mercy. So we go on and we look at how, when we started talking about Israel, Ahaziah, the king of Syria, oppressed Israel in all the days of Jehoahaz. And the Lord was gracious unto them. He had compassion on them and he had respect unto them because of the covenant with Abraham. See, God keeps his promise. Promise he made to uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he would not utterly destroy them, neither cast them from his presence as yet. Isn't that beautiful? So, God wants people to turn. He knows his promise, he knows who he is, but don't, let's not take him for granted. So, Hazel, the kingdom, it's verse 24. So, Hazel, king of Syria, died, and Ben Hadad, his son, and then instead, this is connecting back to what we read uh, near the beginning. I think it was near the beginning of this particular um, chapter here. The last verse is, and Jehoah, Jehoah, Joash, th thank you. And Joah, Jehoah, <laughs> read it, please. And Jehoash, the son of Jehoah, took again out of the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Hazael, the city which he had taken out of the hand of Jehoahaz, his father, by war. Three times did Joash beat him, 
and recovered the cities of Israel. God allowed him, uh, that the king, to recover some land. You see some things like that even in earlier uh, scriptures. But it's always like, okay, I'm going to get the land back. I'm going to get the land back and so forth. This is, this is sort of, if you will, what we see here. But um, we'll continue to look at what's going on with the the people who are supposed to be led by God's word. We've seen tonight, there's some similar names that will cause confusion. Uh, it causes confusion for me when I go back and try to keep it, keep it straight. But we saw tonight that there was a Jeroboam who will come on the scene. We've read about the first Jeroboam. Now there's a second Jeroboam. Again, I mentioned that we've seen a, a Jehoram, two of them, one in the north, one in the south. We've seen a Ahaziah, one in the north, one in the south. We've seen Joash, a Ho or Jehoash, one in the north, one in the south. <laughs> We're seeing a Jeroboam, too. Something in the name is so identical that it's like maybe it's really significant that these, I think it is, that these names are, are the same. Um, now, that is not to say that they could have similar names and that we see some benevolence or people who would serve God righteously. But I'm looking at the the, the, the pattern of wickedness as far as how I want to do, uh, put it out there this evening. Well, Lord's bless us to come through this 13th chapter. Lord willing, we'll pick back up. I do want to look at Amaziah uh, next week. So I don't know if I'll be in the, the 14th chapter at all. Uh, it starts a little bit there, but I know I've been looking at that 25th chapter, Second Chronicles. Thank you, Lord, for giving us an opportunity to go through your scripture. Help us uh, not to take you for granted. And if there is a need for us to, to seek you, help us to repent and, and, and seek you. And if, 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 if we walked outside of your will, Father, help us in your spirit to turn and, um, Help us just remain faithful to you. We know that you have you have an expectation of us. We want to live under the right name, the people of God, children of God. I ask these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to open up for discussion if there's going to be any on this evening. You got to, uh, okay. Anyone this evening? This was this is the kind of message I like to preach right there, right there. Yes, sir. See why he said God has forsaken you? Mm-hmm. That's that's keep that's keeping on what Joshua said and what Moses said. And you have people that go to your churches, you know, the kind that you like, and <laughs> they'll say They'll start the thing, I'll say, God say, I will never leave you, and they'll say, or forsake you. What they've done is they've lied on God. Mm -hmm. They've lied on him. He will forsake you quickly. He will forsake you when you forsake him. Yes. Like, first of all, Joshua, Joshua said, you can't serve you can't serve God because he's holy. I just, when I read it, I feel good in my bones. <laughs> Because it it allow it allows you to see it's worth it to be steadfast. Mm -hmm. It's worth it to say what he says. It's worth it to trust in him because he's got he's got a way to you know when he pulls that out and say he's holy. But everybody else make it like he ain't really holy. He ain't really all of that, but he is. And then when you brought it up about Elisha, that was really one of the things that happened when. The first time I heard a uh, man named John William Oliver talk about that, I was about 17, and I didn't know that was in the Bible. And it made it bothered me. It bothered me so much. And I, I said at that time, it'll never be somebody else ever be able to say something that in the Bible I hadn't read. It bothered me that much. It doesn't bother people now that you say something they don't know what's in the Bible. They'll argue with you. you. Don't even know what they're talking about. Need to have their mouth shut. Maybe even glue with that super glue. Because that will be better for them not to open their mouth and let their folly, ignorance, and arrogance come out and let it infiltrate and permeate and stink up the air. But it's just 
they don't care. They don't care that there's nothing in the Bible that they don't know. Then we're talking about just knowing that we ain't talking about fully understanding it. It's as if whatever God says is no more than what somebody else say. And that's why we have a world full of people right now that they, their biggest thing is to find something they can say against Trump. Or the biggest thing they could, they could say was something against Obama. How about saying something about what's righteous and ungodly, irrespective of whether it's Trump, Obama, Tim, John, Frank, or, or, or Willing Frankenstein? See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But we get these personality judgments as opposed to righteous judgments. All of that is to say, I, I think this is a righteous judgment. You were right. They would probably be trying to sell the bones or or somebody, especially, oh, Lord have mercy, we know there are a group of people that will go dig up your bones and your artifacts, and they will keep them from everybody else in the world, yeah. and they might and they might make um, replicas of them and, and, and they charge you to see it. And because the Syrians were coming, they didn't dig the bones up or take the bones probably. But I would submit to you that an individual touching that man's bones that had died through his death, it seemed like he gave that man life again. That's mm -hmm. just, it's just something to that that's just quite amazing. Because it didn't have to be mentioned. Right. Now, I understand if somebody say, oh, God wanted it mentioned, it had to be mentioned. I'll grant that. But I'm saying, why did he tell us that? He didn't tell us that somebody touched the Lord's bones or his body and he was raised up from the dead. Right. And if they touched Elisha's bones, they looked like to me Elisha had been buried for a while and, uh, and, and and being a man of God didn't stop the decay, didn't probably stop the maggots, the worms, or whatever kind of beetles that go through and eat through the eye socket and all of the things that bugs do and have their tasty meal. And, but that was something that through his death, or through the death that he had already, you know, experienced, that that individual was thrown in there. And can you imagine? You throw Quay Tud, you know, y'all in fucking throw Quay Tud in there. He been slaughtered, and it, he didn't want to leave him on the ground for the dog. So you take him. You don't have time to really lay him really good. You just you throw him in there. You're at least trying to do something, and then you look up. Ah, Quay Tud. <laughs> <laughs> Can yeah. you imagine the ooh wee worse than the movie, boy? Because you, <laughs> you, you, you would think if it wasn't a war, they would go get those bones. Mm -hmm. If that's what raised him back up, why wouldn't you want to get some of those bones and bring them with you, you know? Yeah. They'd have probably done it like they did uh, Nehushtan, uh, that, the, the serpent that was on the bra brazen pole. Yeah. I, I thought I thought about those. I thought about that. Those you forsake him, and because you forsook him, you won't prosper. Do you? The, the amazing thing about that is, you have mega churches, whole denominations that have really forsaken the ways, the word, the will of the Most High God. They have done the equivalent of the Jeroboam son of Nebat worship. We got our own new form of worship. They've done the same thing that Antiochus Epiphanes did, changed the worship. You got what is, they call these orthodoxies in the Catholic movement. They have done their own thing, and they have really said, we have taken over. We have the right because we look like we are prospering. We have weaponry, we have an army, and we can change the worship of the Most High God because truly the, wor the worship of him is all about power. It's about getting in touch with the spiritual world and getting power and how do I feel yeah. when I do it. So we see that mess back then, and we see that we're susceptible to all kinds of spirits. And until we get our mind right, we're not going to hasten the day of the Lord's coming. You know, when people talk about, well, it's the earthquake, the Lord get ready to come. Are they killing children? The Lord get ready. You ain't done nothing to hasten it. 
we done nothing. You might we might wipe off another generation. We might wipe off, you know, what we call our technological advances. But I don't see that just because you're doing stuff is going to, you know, we continue to end our wickedness and our filth and our flaw. But that's going to hasten it. That, that, that is not what Peter said would hasten it. I'm through talking. Well, that was good. I think if... Uh... I had seen the man come back. I, I would, I believe, I don't know. I just might faint. I'd be <laughs> scared, just super scared. It made me think of when they thought Jesus was a spirit when he was walking on the water a little bit. But, um, yeah, that's, that's, I don't know. That's, that's, that's inexplicable to me except for that God allowed it. Is there anyone else this evening? application for us um, if we continue to sin willfully after receiving knowledge of the truth there remains no more sacrifice for sin you know in other words Christ sacrifice I can't I can't hear well you can't hear well so I don't know if you need to turn up a volume or well it's it's your mic that's picking up because if I if I turn okay up, So what I was what I was saying is when Gary brought in the tenth chapter of Hebrews in the twenty sixth verse about if you can sin if you continue to sin willfully after receiving knowledge of the truth there remains no more sacrifice for sin and in other words Christ's sacrifice is of none effect for those who are committing sin willfully you know it's, there's um, I can't remember where where the scripture is found, but it talks about cru- crucifying Christ afresh. You know, if if you're just continuing to sin, if if you know if you know that what you are doing is sinful and you keep on doing it, um, or if you're committing a sin of the high hand, then why why did Jesus make the sacrifice on the cross for us? So you know, I um, you know, I guess I guess the I close that thought by saying when God delivers and or pardons us, we shouldn't be taking His mercy for granted and continuing in sin. Amen. Thank you for your your comments. Um, I'm not sure if the verse you're talking. I, I want to say it's in Hebrews as well, but I. I confused. Chapter six. Tim says in chapter six. Yeah. Now, here, here is the deal. When he said he would rather have mercy instead of sacrifice, I thought that was. You just faded out. I don't know if you. Oh, can can you can you? I, I uh, went. I went. I went through a. I probably went through an area. But I said it, I liked that when he said he would rather have mercy instead of sacrifice. When you brought that out, that was, that's the thing. I'd re- I'd rather you repent. I would rather you repent and have your heart right to just give me a dog on, to just bring a sacrifice. I would rather have that. And we, we'd rather confess. We don't even really care about the sacrifice. If we could just confess and go and sing, and get Kurt Franklin to get up there and look like he got on makeup and get some kind of celebrity to get up there and sing, and we can wear our tight spanks, and we can get up there and have some kind of preacher to go, ha, ha, and then laugh, and then go home, we'll be happy. Because it doesn't seem to matter anymore. The truth really doesn't. We can sing 50, 100,000 hours. But when it comes down to minding our, making our mind to be molded into his, we don't want to hear it. 
we we think the scripture man will not live by bread alone, but every song that can come out of some unregenerate oh, person's yeah. mind that they can write and that we can sing and repeat and what and that's what we live by. But we 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 act like the judgment of God and His throne. That doesn't that that only rules in heaven. You can be wicked and ungodly and be going to go and have all kind of ungodly sex and doing those kind of things and die, and people still tell you to rest in heaven. And he's going to be with the Lord. What kind of mess? I don't want to be in heaven with the kind of people that I talk to that say they don't care a thing about God and make fun of God. And then when I tell them they act like I'm stupid and they act like they got a better way and they're supposed to be something. I'm not my dear like Love and See did that day. I mean what I'm saying. I don't want to be in heaven with Love and See. Is Love and See going to have that kind of attitude toward the most high? I don't want to see no more this. Disrespect for God no more. As long as I live, when I when I raise from the dead, I don't want to see that no more. I find it disgusting, vile, and distasteful. Let me get off the get off the, the talk so because I'm getting a, I'm getting upset with the wicked. I don't even know why, but it's vile. <laughs> you say you don't know why? Yes, you do. <laughs> we supposed to. We supposed to. Any other comments tonight? Questions? Insight? Okay, we're going to um, count down a little bit, and then if no one uh, speaks up, then we will close out our lesson for this evening. And we, Lord willing, will pick back up looking at um, these kings on next next week. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, thank you all for calling in. This evening, and uh, Lord willing, we'll connect back up on Thursday night. Love you. Good night, Good night everybody. Night.